Giddy up, we ghosties. <laughs> I'm Chance Lee. And I'm Amanda McAvoy. And this is That's So Gothic, a movie podcast about girls, guys, and haunted houses. Today, we're heading to Montana and singing a song about a Panano man. It's Power of the Dog. Twenty-five years since our first run together. Nineteen hundred and nothing. It's a long time. What you doing? Getting mixed up with her. You are marvelous, Rose. We were married someday. Released in 2021, The Power of the Dog was directed by Jane Campion. It stars Benedict Cumberbatch as Phil Burbank, Jesse Plemons as his brother George, Kirsten Dunst as George's bride, Rose Gordon, and Cody Smith-McPhee as her son, Peter. It was adapted by Campion from the 1975 novel by Thomas Savage. It has a 94% critical tomato and a 76% audience tomato. Really? Hmm. Uh, we'll talk about that. I, audiences get really confused by this movie in a way okay. I find interesting. Mm-hmm. Monica Castillo for RogerEbert.com gave it four stars. It received a plethora of Academy Award nominations. Mm-hmm. I think everybody I named got a nomination for their respective really? categories. And Campion won Best Director, making her the third woman to ever do so. Mm-hmm. I thought this one best picture, but it did not. That went to Coda. Oh, okay. Yep. Did you see Coda? I didn't. I didn't. I remember Power of the Dog that year being like the big deal. That one, just every single category it was nominated for. Yeah, it was the front runner, but I guess it didn't win as much as I thought. Yeah. Um, It was nominated with Coda and um, Licorice Pizza, which is true horror to me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that movie was agonizing. Um, <laughs> so uh, Power of the Dog uh, was recently released on Criterion Collection oh. on November 8th. So yeah. I'm excited about that. It was made for around $35 million, but mm-hmm. it didn't have a theatrical release. So we have no box office numbers because it was released right. on Netflix. Yes. Is this our first streaming movie? It must be, right? I think so. First stream, right. on, streaming, streaming only. Streaming only. All right. And maybe like, I feel like Netflix is moving away from this type of prestige film after trying it for a few years and continually losing the Oscar. I was going to say, it kind of felt like a little bit of like a drop in a bucket. Like Netflix started with, you know, I feel like a lot of, it was like Netflix originals were always TV shows and then Mm -hmm. they tried with these movies. And then for whatever reason, I can't think of like a prestige movie that they've come out with in the past year, at least off the top of my head. No, we still have, and like, it's, it's prestige season. Like it's starting now and I don't think there's anything coming up, but. No, I feel like they've been doing a lot of horror. Um, Yeah. Horror and teen comedies. Yes. Yep. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. So um, Jane Campion, New Zealander. Mm -hmm. Have you seen any of her films? I know I saw the piano, the panano, uh, the panano, of course, um, a long, long time ago, though. Um, Because when did that movie come out? Uh, It had to have been, gosh, 90, 90, 92, 92. That long ago? Yeah, because what was the movie we talked about that was directed by the guy that did the crying game? What was, oh, what it was that we, oh, it was Interview with the Vampire. Oh, okay. um, Neil Jordan. Yeah. And The Crying Game and The Piano, I think, came out around the same time. So it was definitely pre-94. Mm, mm. Wow. Okay. So I watched this, I watched The Piano then definitely when I was a teenager um, because I went through an Adrian Brody fan. Uh, not Brody. <laughs> Adrian, what is his name? Is that his name? Adrian? From The uh, Piano? From the piano, hold on. I think I'm messing. I up remember. Ho- I remember Holly Hunter and Harvey Keitel. 
what am I thinking of then? I'm thinking of a different movie, I think, entirely. Are you thinking of The Pianist with Adrian Brody? The Pianist! (laughs) Then I never never saw The Pianist. Very different. Very different. (laughs) (sighs) Okay, I was thinking, I was like, wow, what a dark movie for her to do. Yeah, much more. Re- that is much more recent. The P, okay, the P, was the P- say, mist wow, was like early two thousands. Yeah, early two thousands. Okay, then I did not see. I don't think I've ever seen any of her movies. <laughs> okay, <laughs> her movies are very. Um, I find them dense okay. and a little bit. I don't know if cold is the right word, but there's a distance. Mm. And yeah. they can be a little hard to crack sometimes. Mm-hmm. So I have seen the the Panano. It the has. Panano. That has Holly Hunter and uh-huh. Anna Paquin, who's, oh. I think Holly Hunter is mute, and okay. Anna Paquin is her daughter, mm-hmm. and then there's Hi- Harvey Keitel is weirdly sexy in it, and <laughs> <laughs> and like there's a I, there's a piano I forget yeah. the whole story, and then she did a mini series called Top of the Lake with Elizabeth Moss, which oh I haven't seen that but I, I wanted to I didn't know that was her. Yeah, and it well, it had two seasons. I've only seen the first one. Mm. That also had Holly Hunter. That was very good. And she did like bright. A, oh, sorry. I was just going to ask. That was like a true crime or something, or like a crime thriller. It was a crime thriller. I yeah. don't know if it was based in fact or not. Okay. But what I really liked about it is that it had the gorgeous New Zealand vistas that we yeah. all know, except it was about these really seedy people who live in these Ooh. gorgeous places. Okay. So there's a really nice juxtaposition there. Yeah. And Elizabeth Moss has, you know, been granted the power of Scientology to be one of the <laughs> uh, great greatest living actresses of her time. I love Elizabeth yeah. Moss. Um, so she really commands that, right. that show. Okay. And uh, Campion also did Bright Star, which is the bio- biography of poet John Keats. Oh, okay. That's oh, a, I do think I, I saw that a long time ago. Yeah, that's also yeah. from like a decade ago. Very yeah. sweet, romancy. Um, and then my one of my favorite movies of all time is In the Cut. In the Cut. I don't know that one. It's the movie that basically ended Meg Ryan's career. <laughs> so now, it, is so, that why you like it? Do you have a vendetta against <laughs> Meg Ryan? <laughs> Actually, never cared for Meg Ryan either way. I oh. was not in the, I don't really like romantic comedies, so I never yeah. engaged with Meg Ryan that much. Uh-huh. And this was her playing against type film. Oh, okay. And everyone hated this movie. It got really? critically roasted. It was a flop because people going in expecting a Meg Ryan movie definitely did not yeah. get that. It yeah. is very dark. Mm. And what I like about In the Cut is that it, Kind of like, not as much as this movie, Power of the Dog, but it engages with toxic masculinity, mm. but it stands both how damaging toxic masculinity is yep. and frankly, how hot it can be. <laughs> <laughs> and like, <laughs> I've never seen a movie that really engaged with that. Like yeah. she is attracted, Mark Ruffalo is in it and he's very uh, sexy and oh. such an asshole. And it's yeah. like- she knows he's an asshole, but she's also attracted to him maybe because he's an asshole. And like, right. it's so complex and interesting. Um, really fascinating movie that I love. Interesting. So this movie, um, we'll, we'll get into it a little bit more, but there's, you know, it's, a, it's some gay cowboy uh, action, yep. for lack of a better word. Um, Sam Elliott, famous mustache. Yeah. Said that this movie was a piece of shit. I remember that. (laughs) And all these fucking cowboys running around in chaps and no shirts. And there's all these allusions to homosexuality throughout the fucking movie. (laughs) I think that was the first time because I did not watch this movie when obviously this was my first time watching this movie. And I really didn't have any interest in watching it when it first came out I was like oh typical cowboy movie and then I remember when he said that that was the first time where I was like I don't want to watch that movie (laughs) (laughs) he probably got more people to watch it by saying that and then I kind of forgot about it until you just brought it up so oh for sure yeah someone mentioned it to me today and I was like oh I forgot about that I've got to mention the Sam Elliott comment and Jane Campion I wish I could do a 
uh, Australian New Zealand accent. <laughs> yeah, or, is it, what do you say? Razor blades, razor blades. Razor blades. I, she oh, said, no. <laughs> she said, I think he's been a little bit of a B-I-T-C-H. Ooh. Plus, he's not a cowboy. He's an actor. Oh, so she I roasted him with that. And he did later apologize okay. for that. Yeah. Um, I watched I, I watched this when it came out, I think, because I was I loved in the cut so much. And I was just yeah. curious about what Jane Campion was doing. And I I wonder how much of the movie had like Netflixization done to it because mm. it's divided into parts for no reason. Yeah. I thought that was very strange. Almost like they're trying to make it four episodes of a limited series instead of a movie. <laughs> yeah. Right. Maybe they were going to do that. And then they were like, Oh shit, this is good. And we could, you know, win an Oscar with this. Let's throw it together. I mean, I'm sure that's not what they did, but like, that's how it felt. It did know? feel that way. And I wonder, cause I'm not a binge watcher. And mm. so I would watch it after work and I would just watch like a part and then turn it off. And so yeah. I watched it over like four nights the first time I watched it. Yeah. I mean, I told you, um, <laughs> I started watching it on an airplane and I had to stop because spoiler alert, there is full frontal nudity. I mean, you see Benedict Cumberbatch's whole <laughs> cumber, cumber patch his cumber patch <laughs> his cumber patch uh and i was like i really don't want to you know catch a catch a charge on this airplane you know <laughs> my luck yes. the uh the, the stewardess would come right up behind me or something um but so i ended up watching it i think over three different times it was like that and that's pretty i think that was like halfway through the movie um yes and then I put it that's on almost again. exactly halfway yes and then I put it on again like before I went to bed one night I watched it for you know I think a half an hour and then I finished it another night and it was really good for that yeah it's very uh, just not a value judgment it's very slow it's very yes. slow burn so yeah. the parts even though they're only 20 30 minutes at a time feel much longer yes yeah absolutely and I think the parts like the beginning part felt very long to me. It probably helped that I was like strapped to an airplane chair, um, but it felt very long to me. Maybe that hurt it actually. Cause I was like, get me the hell out of here. Um, and then I think it was the second to last part felt long to me too. Even though that was probably where the most stuff happened. Yeah. That's where it, almost the plot it doesn't really have a plot. It's just more mm. of like a character study. And yeah, it starts to pick up a plot after that point. Quite yeah, literally, because yeah. one character starts plotting something, even though we don't aren't really aware of it at the time. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. But speaking of that, there are also these random voiceovers. And whenever I hear a voiceover in a movie, or I forget what they call it. There's a, there's a term for it where the character is speaking, but you don't see their mouth move. And it was clearly dubbed in post-production. Oh, okay. Those, those always throw me off. And I wonder if Netflix had them added in because the it would have been too obtuse um, without it. Because the first time you watch it, you're, I was kind of like, anyway, what's, what's going on? And then yeah. the ending surprised me. Oh, yeah. And then the second time I watched it, I'm like, oh, they telegraph everything in the first five minutes. Yeah. And because there's Cody Smith McPhee gives a voiceover about protecting his mother. And mm. there's a random voiceover where they're like, watch out for that cow. It's got anthrax, you know, and it just comes out of nowhere. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and they do that a few times. And I'm like, this has to be a little bit of producers having their hand in it. Yeah. 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 Because I've only seen it the one time. So I, I didn't like catch that this time or I didn't remember it by the end of the movie. I did have to go on Wikipedia and just like double check that what I saw happened in the movie happened. <laughs> like I was yes. like, did that, like, is he like, you know, it, you know, again, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen the whole movie when he's picking out the coffin, I was like, wait, who, who, who died? I'm confused. Like, <laughs> I was like did, did Rose end up dying? Like I was very confused, but yeah. Um, yeah, but that's an interesting point about the beginning part. I'll definitely have to rewatch that because that is funny. How do how do you know if a cow has anthrax? Do you have any idea? I was looking this up. I was trying to do really? some research on yeah. what, and also like I only knew anthrax from around nine like, eleven time when yeah. people were getting it in the mail. Yeah, like the white powder. Yeah, and so it is a fungus that is naturally occurring. And so when cows eat grass, it could have anthrax spores in it. Oh. 
But Ooh. how you know they have it, I'm not sure. It, there's that part in the movie where there's the dead cow from Anthrax. Yeah. And like, I don't know if that's its anus that's their big infected hole. Oof, but yeah. <laughs> maybe that's part of it. Yeah. Maybe that's what Anthrax does to you. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah, a little butthole hurtage. Oh. Ugh, yeah, I maybe there's not. some a uh, lot of stuff expelling out of that end. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm never opening a piece of mail again. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's ricin. We've moved on from anthrax to ricin. Oh, so, interesting. Yeah, okay. Different, different airborne parasite. Ah, all right. Like, yes. You know. <laughs> it's either that or a bomb. Yeah. So, right. Yeah. yeah. Or Bill. Sometimes I'd oh. rather it be a rather it be anthrax than a yeah. Seriously. You know, a bill. <laughs> <laughs> So um, this was based on a book, as we mentioned. Uh, had you ever heard of this author before, Thomas Savage? Um, I have not. And yeah, nope. I had no idea. Me neither. And no clue who this person was. Uh, I was doing some research on him when I first watched this movie when it came out. Mm -hmm. And I found out. So I'm a children's librarian by day. Mm -hmm. uh, gothic <laughs> podcaster by night. <laughs> and um, there's an article uh, written by someone named Alan... Wel Weltzine, Alan Weltzine, for Western Writers Online oh. in February 2015 called Thomas Savage's Queer Country. And it mentions that Thomas Savage had a passionate gay love affair with author of Stregonona, Tommy DePaola. Oh, <laughs> I love that so much. Blew my wig clean off, like <laughs> bald. Like I could not believe that. Like oh. Strega, no, no, like hello. Yes. Uncle Tommy, I can't believe it. Oh. So he writes this author, Weltzine, writes about this in depth, saying that mm -hmm. uh, according to Thomas Savage's daughter, when Savage proposed to Elizabeth, who was his wife, he told her he was gay, but she thought she could cure him. Ooh. And in 1960, he met 20, Tommy DePaula, who was 20 years younger than him. Ooh. And they kind of had the same name, Thomas and Tommy. Yeah. Um, they fell in love and T Savage left his family for a year for Tommy wow. Paola. And the couple even exchanged rings at a chapel in Boston. <gasps> oh my goodness. <laughs> we'll have to visit. <laughs> the Cowley Father's Chapel. I don't know if that's still there, but yeah. the site of the uh, unofficial nuptials of Thomas Savage and Tommy DePaola. It needs a I plaque. It. it does. It needs a plaque. Uh, but it only lasted a year. Th Thomas Savage felt very uh, regretful and returned mm -hmm. to his family, who never forgave him. His <laughs> and his daughter called Tommy DePala a snake who destroyed her childhood. How dare you? He gave you Stregonona. <laughs> Stre right? Imagine giving her a book. It's like <laughs> she just like, throws Stregonona across the room. This witch destroyed my childhood. <laughs> gay snake <laughs> oh my gosh it's like but i would be like sweetie like maybe look at your father here there's yeah. some misplaced anger right. there well especially because he was 20 years older there's always gonna be a weird there's a power balance. dynamic yep yes so he thomas savage actually wrote a novel about his liaison with de Paula, but his agent said it would never get published so he threw it into the sea <gasps> Wow, so dramatic. I love it, though. And I know he's, well, he's a big drama queen. Yeah. We'll learn, the, so are the, some of the characters in this movie. <laughs> yep. And there's a literary critic. Most of this essay is about a liter. it's a literary criticism of his work. Mm -hmm. And he says that there's a critic named Carl Olson who defines... Um, oh, let me go back a bit. He talks about the gender protest of his novels and characters who don't adhere to strict masculine or feminine dynamics. And this critic, Carl Olson, defines this protest as homothanatism, homothanatism, which he defines as the tragic consequences of homosexual desire, as though homosexuality inevitably leads to disaster. Okay, so that's kind of like a fancy way of putting that trope of, um, what's it called, killing your gays? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's like the scientific way of saying that. Interesting. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So with that note, I say let's get right into it. Yes. <laughs> that kind of sets the tone. I had no idea that's what this movie was going to be about either when I first Me neither. started watching it. I was like, oh, I'll watch this cowboy movie. Literally. Um, I didn't know it was like a Brokeback Mountain for a new generation. 
I had no idea. And even watching it, because I didn't, the Sam Elliott thing, I don't think I either read the whole thing or I didn't realize he was, he meant literally they were going to be gay. So I had no idea going <laughs> into this movie. <laughs> like right. I thought he was just being like extremely mean. Um, but even watching the movie, I was like, oh, it is beautiful. Like, you know, it took me like, and then, you know, sort of, and we'll talk about this more later, but just some of the little bits that start to come up in the movie I was like is it supposed to be is it not um so yeah I was very blindsided by this yes I think I I think me watching it a couple times and knowing what's going to happen made me forget how subtle it is yeah on first watch right well and I think I'm like oh my god this is so obvious of course but I was trying to remember when I first watched I had no idea where it was going and really gasped at the end right well I also like am always rooting for characters to be gay so sometimes (laughs) I'm like true you need to stop doing that yeah like you need to stop looking into that like you're being weird but this was one of those cases where I was telling myself, like, Amanda, like, not everyone is gay. It's not a gay cowboy movie. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, well, damn it. It <laughs> like, is. <I> so. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I always do as well, especially when they're yeah. hot cowboys. It's exactly. like, exactly. Mm-hmm. Of course. But <laughs> <laughs> against my better judgment. But I was right this time. Every once in a while, it pays off. Mm hmm. <laughs> So this movie opens in 1925, Montana, filmed in New Zealand, but they make it look like Montana. Really beautiful. And there's a voiceover from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And we don't even know who's talking at this point. And we won't even see this character for like 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. So it's Cody Smith McPhee's character, who's Rose's son and he says when my father passed i wanted nothing more than my mother's happiness for what kind of man would i be if i did not help her if i did not save her and then we get some cows some chaps (laughs) uh (laughs) benedict cumberbatch is stomping around i love the way he walks in chaps it is so funny his chaps are like comically large (laughs) They flap all over the place. Like, talk about overcompensation for masculinity. Yeah, like, you're gonna you know watch this it's movie. the biggest chaps. <laughs> he so is the he's biggest chaps. He is the, he's a big chap. Yeah. So he stomps around. So he's plays Phil Burbank, and Jesse Plemons is his brother George. Mm-hmm. He calls him Fatso a lot. Fatso. They're on a cattle drive, and we quickly get the conflict between the two brothers in that. Phil wants this country life Mm -hmm. and he wants to preserve the legacy of someone named Bronco Henry, Mm -hmm. who we'll learn a lot about. And the brother, George, wants a more like civilized city lifestyle. He doesn't like this country living. He doesn't drink. He doesn't want to be out doing the horses and stuff anymore. He's more the business side of things. Yeah. So in this town they're going to, we meet the innkeeper, Rose Gordon, who they uh, Phil calls a suicide widow later mm. on. And we'll learn that her husband was drunk who killed himself. Yep. She does not drink as a side note. And she has a son, Peter. We meet him. He is making a flower out of paper. Mm-hmm. And Peter's character has a theme music that is a piano tune a slightly discordant piano tune that plays yeah. whenever he's on screen so that'll be very thematic later on so they go to dinner at this inn there's a very rowdy crowd yes. and there's some very explicit fingering of the stamens of this yes. <laughs> <paper> flower <laughs> really really rough with it <laughs> yes he it's very rough with the uh the rosebud we shall yeah. say and yes yeah, so uh, right away I, that's when i was like huh like yeah. you know i was kind of probably not paying attention to this movie <laughs> and then benedict cumberbatch sticks his finger in that flower and i was like bing hello <laughs> what is happening here what's going on i better pay attention paying attention <laughs> so he then starts to make fun of peter because peter has a lift Mm-hmm. Um, and he burns the flower right in front of him to light mm-hmm. his cigarette. 
So Rose, we learn she's very protective of her son. She comes in, she takes all the flowers off the table. And we also learn that Phil really hates p- piano music. <laughs> he just fucking <laughs> hates it. People hates are playing piano. piano. He screams at them, <laughs> tells them to get out. Yep. He's so aggressive. And yeah, he'll, he, call, that's where this is where this comes from. The banana, yep, the, the banana, he calls it the banana multiple times, which I <laughs> adore. So good. So Peter is very upset. He has this stress thing where he kind of fingers the teeth of his comb mm-hmm. when he's upset. And then probably my favorite scene in the movie is when he goes up back and very aggressively hula hoops behind the <laughs> inn. <laughs> Oh, uh, is there any other way to hula hoop though? <laughs> I love that. Like, and then this girl walks by and sees him, and he just stops and like yeah. stares at her. <laughs> There's okay. no context, and no. I just adore that. Yeah. One of the my letterbox reviews said, you know, when I was a kid, I also used to aggressively hula hoop and plot the deaths of my enemies. So I really <laughs> identify with this movie. <laughs> It's nice to so, see yourself on screen. It is. I, I feel I feel represented <laughs> for represented. once in my life. <laughs> so uh, everyone leaves uh, after dinner, except for George, who stays behind to comfort Rose. Mm-hmm. And he actually confronts Phil about it and takes Rose's side, saying he was mean. Yeah. And that's the end of part one. So now we have a part two, which opens with our first of multiple shots of shirtless cowboys romping with one another yep so they're also looking at the mountains and talking about how phil sees something out there that no one else sees yep this will be thematic later george pays a visit to rose in town and she is overwhelmed and he very sweetly steps in to be the waiter he gets the yeah, towel over his arm it's very cute it's very precious Jesse they're Clemens both is adorable they're very sweet and boring. Like, yeah, like, and that's right. the point of their characters is they're just like sweet and dull and simple. Yep. They're vanilla <laughs> ice cream. <laughs> it's so, I know it's so precious. Yeah. So back home, uh, George and Phil get into a fight mm-hmm. and George admits that he has married Rose and Phil gets so mad. He goes <laughs> into the barn and beats his horse. Yeah, I know. That was tough to watch. That was. I mean, because like, it looks so realistic. It's so real. I mean, there's. I, I don't know how they did it. I'm. I'm not going to speculate, but I mean, there was like no CGI. Like, oh my god, that poor horse. Yeah, that was rough, and and that's a, even too. I'm like, wait a second. Does he like? Is he like attracted to his brother? Like, I was really yeah. trying to figure. Why is he so upset? Right, and that's at Rose. Where, that's when like my mind was doing the whole like Amanda stop thinking everything's gay because he was he he seemed like oddly I mean I guess he was protective of his brother probably yeah um but yeah he does think Rose is a gold digger yes because we'll get more context as the movie goes on but they are very rich yes they are they are wealthy um and she is not um, but yeah, I was, I was a little bit sort of confused by that dynamic. I was trying to remember when I first watched it, it, when I realized they're brothers, like, I don't think I realized right away. I probably mm. thought they were just business partners for a while yeah. and maybe there was an attraction there. And then I realized they were brothers and I was like, is there still an attraction here? Like yeah. what is happening? Right. So, um, so we get to part three, which is, uh a really stressful one this is where (laughs) stuff really starts to ratchet up yep um so uh rose drops off peter at a boarding house for college students he's going to school and they they they're george is with her they're going back to this gigantic house that they have in the middle of nowhere montana and george wants to introduce rose to his parents And just casually the governor, just invite the governor governor down. Yeah, which I was like kind of thinking, I was like, is that like, you know, a funny nickname? Like, you know, like like a cowboy, like a, you know, governor, like, (laughs) I'm sure it was the governor of Montana. 
Yeah, it's that's when you like I I again I did not know what was happening the first time yeah. I watched it, and it's like oh like just because they are so rich and they come from such a rich powerful family yeah. that they hang out with the governor on a regular basis. Right. Gosh, who doesn't? <laughs> and Rose clearly is very insecure about this. Yeah. So they pull over, though, on the side of the road for a picnic on this beautiful snowy vista Mm -hmm. and very pretty. There's a behind the scenes documentary uh, about this movie that's not very interesting, but you do see them sprinkle sugar and nail sheets of cotton to the ground. That's so funny. (laughs) To get the little snowfall. I was like, oh, that's neat. So they have a very sweet, touching moment. He just kind of stares at her and says she's marvelous. And yeah, she teaches him to dance. But he also like hates dancing. He gets really mad about it. Like, yeah, he's uh, he's very insecure. They're all both very insecure. And, yeah. But he says it's nice to not be alone. And yeah, you know, they have this. And you think about like, I mean, they're in Montana. Like, there's no way to find anyone else. Right, right. Well, and the fact that he says that, and technically he doesn't live alone. He actually lives with his brother in this huge gaggle of, you know, what are they called? Cowboys. Forgot the word for cowboy. Um, And servants. They have servants. Yeah, right. So he's living in a big house with a lot of people, but he he felt alone. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Little buddy. um, I know. It's very precious. Yeah. So the, all the uh, niceness is instantly ruined when they get home and mm-hmm. Rose calls Phil brother, Phil. And he says, I'm not your brother. You're a cheap schemer. Yep. And he plays his banjo in his room <laughs> and mocks her in this childish voice. Like, hi, brother, Phil. Like just, yep. just this little bitch. <laughs> <laughs> He's so obnoxious. Um, and then George, they, they like, they have the, bathroom that sorry bedrooms that are conjoined by a bathroom like Mm -hmm. a suite and so George locks the door to the bathroom from the other side yeah and shows Rose around and uh Phil has to listen to them creaking their bed springs and oh boy he gets all upset and that's another thing where I'm like is what is going on why is he so upset by this yes and maybe it is a sexuality thing which will start to come clear later where he's maybe jealous because he can't have that yeah that's what i was gonna say is you know he's he's jealous of his brother that he found this lovely heterosexual bland relationship and (laughs) he'll never be happy in that (laughs) no he'll never be happy with that that's a good point yeah um and so he goes outside and starts like suggestively fondling bronco henry's saddle Mm mm-hmm He's all up on the pommel of that thing. (laughs) And the next day he crawls through a hole in a tree and goes to this secret bathing spot that he has in the woods. And we'll go back there later. But Rose is still very uncomfortable Mm -hmm. in this situation. She goes to hang out with the housekeepers, which makes them uncomfortable because she's the lady of the house. (laughs) (laughs) She is washing dishes with them. One of the housekeepers is Thomas and McKenzie who was the lead of One Night in Soho. <laughs> so oh. <laughs> <laughs> it was, It's so strange, because I think that movie came out in theaters before this release on Netflix. And I'm like, really? why is she in this nothing part in this movie? Yeah. But she's the lead in another movie. That's so funny. So, I don't know when they were filmed or what, but she's yeah. in that and she's in, uh, uh, not us, she's in old, old. Oh, okay. When they start getting old, she's the young girl who gets old. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So, um, so that I thought that was interesting. I'm like, why is she in this movie? She's very funny in the couple scenes that she has though. Mm. So men arrive with a baby grand piano from the Mason and Hamlin Panano company. Yes. Which is in the town in which I live. Yeah. I, I don't know when I made that connection, but I was like, wait a second. That's the one that's like. Like I can, it's very close to me Yeah, and it's still in business. There's still, I see people come in and out of here. I I play Pokemon Go. It's a Poke stop. (laughs) So (laughs) 
I love sending people the postcard from Mason and Hamlin Panano Company, and I'm like, I hope they've seen Power of the Dog. Like, yeah, right. That off. <laughs> <laughs> they've seen Power in the do- of the Dog, and they remember that obscure <laughs> one second scene. <laughs> that Venn diagram, th- those are like almost two separate circles. Like those yeah. circles do not connect, or there's just a hair where they connect, and it's me. Like that's. <laughs> That's you're just it. waving in the middle of it. <laughs> that's it. I, I'm the link that's holding the two circles together. <laughs> uh, but um, that's fun. But she, again, she's very upset. This is, I mean, they're in Montana. Yeah. This, this, uh, I live in Massachusetts. That they, they have imported this piano across the entire nation. The world. <laughs> the world. Yes. Yeah. It's like it's bananas. And so she is understandably like, this is too much for me. Yeah. Like I do not deserve this. Um, and Cause she only plays played piano for um, movies. She was, she was the person in the pit who would just play like that. Like, I love that. Yeah. yeah. So she's like, she doesn't feel like she deserves it. She, she doesn't feel like she's, you know, talented enough to have it. And to play piano. He wants her to play piano for the governor. And it's just like, and he won't listen. The one thing that really yeah. frustrates me is that he will not listen to her. Yes. She is clearly uncomfortable. She yeah. is telling him she doesn't want to do this. Yeah. And he is so, it's like, he's so supportive. It like rolls yeah. around to not being supportive. Exactly. Like, he is like Ugh. the nice guy who just will not hear your issues because it's like, no, 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 you're perfect. Why are you worried about that? Like, yeah, he's very frustrating. He's the, like in the writing classes, the one who does your peer review. And it's just like, it's great. It's yeah. so good. And it's you're not so helping good. me. Yeah. No, you're not. Yes. And it's just like, oh, fuck no. And so she is alone because he will yeah. not listen to her. Meanwhile, we're going to get Phil who is actively trying to sabotage her. Yeah. So she sits down. To me, this is the scene of the movie. She, I love this scene. It gives me so much anxiety. Yeah. Um, I have to like turn the movie off like after this sometimes. <laughs> yes. it so much Because she sits down at the piano and she's playing this song. And then you kind of hear the song being played on the banjo. Yeah. I actually don't think I would have heard it, but I had my subtitles on and the subtitles say like banjo playing in distance. <gasps> and I was like, what? Yeah. Oh, so that's it's fun. Very light. Yeah. And yeah, it starts to get louder and you realize Phil is taunting her by playing the same song and he plays it quietly at first. Yeah. Yeah. He plays it quietly and then he plays it loudly and then he just leans into it and has this banjo solo. (laughs) And (laughs) it's just this, and Kirsten Dunst plays it so well Yeah, where just this, this like quiet resigned almost like the death of her spirit. You just watch yes. this start to happen. Right. And it's just, it's just awful. Yeah. And, and, and it doesn't, I don't think she, t- she must not tell George. I don't think she does. Cause he never no. brings this up to him, but I think so. he goes to talk to Phil and, um, he wants to talk to her about, so this is what Phil says, is she on the panano again, setting your teeth <laughs> on edge? <laughs> the panano. Um, but he keeps using this phrase. He wants to talk to her about the visit with his nibs. Mm. And he keeps saying his nibs. <laughs> and like, I'm like, I have to, I have to look that up. I'm like, what the hell is his nibs? Yeah. Does that mean like parents? It's so it's for the governor. It's a term for the governor. And it's oh. like this kind of term you use for someone who's just like in charge, some archaic term for it. And eventually it became sarcastic. So like if you had like a teacher or somebody you really didn't like and you'd be like, oh, his nibs wants to speak to me after class. If you were I some see. like boarding school student. So it became this sarcastic term. Right. But George is not using it that way because he seems to really respect this governor. Yes. And he wants um, George to bathe for his nibs mm-hmm. and the missus, her nibs, I guess, her nibs. <laughs> so. Phil does not want to bathe. He yeah. takes this very uh, personally. So George goes to the train station to pick up his mother and father. Jesse Plemons is wearing this floor length fur coat. Yes. <laughs> he looks like a pimp. <laughs> oh, he does. Yes. It's incredible. Yeah. And his mom is Frances Conroy. Mm-hmm. 
and his dad is an actor I did not recognize. And <laughs> <laughs> Rose is in the distance. Like she's in the distance and she'll kind of remain in the distance because she's very uncomfortable with this. Because again, they're very rich, yeah. you know, and she's meeting this guy's rich parents and got to be expected to perform for them. Mm-hmm. Oh, so the maids are all dressed up in cute hats. They're folding. They're doing like napkin origami. Yeah. And we learn that Phil is a classics major from Yale. And was really, really good at it and very smart, which is makes him saying Panano one billion times funnier. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. It's like, it's almost like he's putting it on, you know, this yeah. like cowboy act. Right. I, it, it, he's such a baffling character to me. And so, but that makes Rose fathoms more insecure. Yes. So, because not only she can't even write him off as some dumbass cowboy now, like right. he's also <laughs> very smart. Um, very and, smart cowboy. Uh, and so, George uh, Lee, and oh my God, this is like I used to have a lot of social anxiety. Oh my goodness. And that, my least favorite thing is going to a party with yep. a date. And yep. I know no one else there. And the date leaves me. Oh my God. And it's like, I feel like he does it on purpose. Like he gives her, her his drink or something and is like, sure. stay here while I go do such. A, oh, oh my God. Yeah. I almost vomited. And Kirsten Dunst takes this like almost imperceptible half step towards yeah. him as he leaves that just like rips me open. Yes. And she, and just the fact because I don't think she really talks like she is definitely not if they talk she's not the one who says the first thing like she is standing there so uncomfortable oh my god it's brutal she does such a good job playing that scene though she's so good yeah because they've just talked about how they want to meet uh they want to meet Phil because he's this genius from Yale yeah and they want to see his sparkling wit yeah. And, and she doesn't have that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, and, and she and she knows she's very self-aware. Right. Um, for better or for worse. And she doesn't drink. They all have these fancy tropical cocktails with like little umbrellas yes. in them. Yeah. So so she's just holding the drink, not talking. It's the most uncomfortable situation. Yep. So George finds Phil in the barn riding Bronco Henry's saddle yet again. Mm-hmm. And in his best john wayne voice which i cannot do yeah. benedict cumberbatch goes i stink and i like it <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> which such is a, a great good, line such a great line <laughs> and um and so he's not going to come in so so rose tries to get out of playing the piano mm-hmm. so many times and george will just not take the hint yeah and she plays literally two notes and just stops. Yeah, her hands are and, like shaking. Oh, it's so uncomfortable. Oh, and she's just like, I can't do it. I don't know what's happened. I can't do it. Yeah. And then that bitch, Phil, comes in whistling the song <sighs> that she was supposed to play. Yep. And he says in front of everyone, you didn't play. You sure did practice a terrible lot. Oh, my God. <laughs> And it's just like, oh my God. And so he whistles the tune and just when he whistles the last note, he locks his eyes on her in this Mm -hmm. just, oh my God, it kills me. Yeah. (laughs) Brutal. Like he is, he is like, like middle school girl level bully, like so mean girls pinpointing insecurities. Oh my goodness. So, so good. Yeah. And as soon as he locks eyes with her and leaves, she takes that drink and she chugs it down. Yep. And then like instantly she's an alcoholic. So yeah. <laughs> we get to, <laughs> I don't know how much time. Well, I guess I guess quite a bit of time probably passes because we we had her dropping Peter off at school. Right. And then assuming they meet probably within a month or so. Mm-hmm. But now we're at the summer of his school break. So it's been almost right. a year, I guess. Yeah. Um, so she's bringing Peter to stay for this summer. Mm-hmm. We get some foreshadowing when we cut to Phil castrating a bull. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> this is foreshadowing in multiple ways because we get the castration scene, mm-hmm. which has its own uh, implications. But we also learn he doesn't like to wear gloves. Yeah. And that will be more important than, than you would think on, especially on first watch. He calls Peter little Lord Fauntleroy, <laughs> which now that I think about it, that's a term I've heard. Yeah. But like, I don't know the, do you know the origin of that? I can't say I do. It gives me big uh, Lord Farquaad vibes. 
Uh, <laughs> <laughs> is that what Lord Farquhar is maybe named after? Maybe. Um, Fauntleroy. So, so Little Lord Fauntleroy is a novel by Frances Hodgson Burnett. Oh. She did, um, uh, which, did she do Secret Garden or Little Princess? Which book? Oh. Um, I always get those two confused. I'm not sure. I think she did. She did Secret Garden. Okay. Oh, so, and A Little Princess. Oh, she did both of them. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, Little Lord Fauntleroy. I guess he's just like a little prim, prim yeah. boy. He's dressed oh. very fancy. Interesting. Apparently, uh, in the story, he lives with his American mother because his father is dead. So... Oh, that is wow. interesting. And that's that's really interesting too, because since it's a book, you know, Mr. Fancy Pants Cowboy learned it at Yale, probably, probably read it. Yes, that's a very good point. He, he knew. knew what he was doing. So, and it also has this effeminate angle to it. Yeah. So we cut to Rose drinking like secret liquor that she stashed in her room and mm-hmm. And the cowboys are tormenting Peter outside. They send a horse to chase him and stuff yep. like that. They're following in what Phil is, the example Phil is setting. So we get more foreshadowing because we see Peter setting a trap. And yep. he catches a rabbit, which he brings back. And Rose is drunk. Mm-hmm. But he show, he shows her the rabbit and tries to cheer her up a bit. Yeah. And the maid, played by... Um, Thomas and Mackenzie. Her name is Lola. Mm-hmm. She she does that weird, like she goes she goes. Can I take it a carrot or whatever? She says yeah. weird accent. And uh, Kirsten does like what? And she doesn't say rabbit. She makes bunny ears yeah, with her goes fingers. Like, goes, yeah. <laughs> She's such a weirdo. I love it. <laughs> and so she goes to take the bunny a carrot, but finds out that Peter has dissected it. So. Yes. <laughs> so rose is like please no more dissecting animals in the house and yeah he says where would a man be if he always did what his mother told him <laughs> <laughs> and he starts to get a fun little personality here yeah um because they play uh rose forces him to play badminton with her <laughs> yeah and he's terrible at it and yeah. Lo- lola's like that was definitely out and he goes you don't have to narrate it lola i'll just remember <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. And we see this scene's very funny because we also see Phil and his comically large chaps coming back from like they're they're very far from him. And he just looks like a little stick figure with chaps flapping. Yes. Like they're so big. <laughs> and poor Rose instantly gets a headache and yep. sees Phil and spirals into anxiety and is like finding a bottle of whiskey out back. And yeah. He's whistling that song to her very quietly. So she almost doesn't even know if it's her yeah. conscious, you know, is this real? Uh, so we cut to naked bathing cowboys yep. and Phil uh, rubs himself down uh, with Bronco Henry's big handkerchief. Yeah. Very and he puts like, it down the front of his pants. Yeah. Very like flowy handkerchief. Like it's almost like a chiffon. It's and it's huge. It's like it's huge. it could be a t-shirt. Yeah. Um, this I went back, I rewound this scene and timed it. It goes on for over two minutes, like two minutes really? and five seconds of Benedict Cumberbatch pledging himself with a hanky. Yep. Um, and then meanwhile, Peter is exploring and finds this the secret tree mm-hmm. and this collection of hunky muscle men magazines. Yeah. Men in it, they're like bodybuilding magazines mm-hmm. of men in posing straps. And <laughs> it's so difficult. I try I did a little bit of research, but not a lot. I was trying mm-hmm. to figure out if these magazines were intentional gay porn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or had just happened to serve that purpose. Right. Because they're very hypermasculine. Yeah. Um, not that those two can be separate, like gay porn and hypermasculine often do go together, but right. like. They're very like, you need to be a real man and like lift weights. Yeah, and stuff. Right. But the men are also literally wearing like fig leaves. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's kind of like, um, you know, like a Victoria's Secret catalog. Like, you know, those are not supposed to be for, you know, the sexual gaze or whatever, but they serve that purpose. So maybe it's something like that. 
Right. And they definitely know that they do and exactly. lean into that. So I'm curious if these magazines are the same. It's like we can hit both markets. Yeah. Right. With right, right. this. Yeah. Because in the like, I mean, because this is still the 1920s in like yeah. the 50s and 60s, they definitely knew their audience by then. Yeah. With these types of magazines. Yeah. But we see on these magazines, Bronco Henry's like <laughs> written his initials on them. <laughs> <laughs> Which is just like, <laughs> like when he's letting people borrow them and then coming back. You haven't given yeah. me back my uh, posing right. strap monthly or whatever it's called. <laughs> like, <laughs> he's got it. Well, or maybe it was like um, Benedict Cumberbatch was actually like you know doodling, like you know how uh, like teenagers do like Phil the- Hart B H. Yeah. Yes, maybe it was like that. Oh. <laughs> But you do get this interesting glimpse into their relationship. It's like, oh, this was a man who was older than Phil mm-hmm. and was sharing Muscle Man magazines with him. Right. Like, there's an interesting, I wonder if the book gets into that in any way, shape, or form, but there's an interesting backdrop of yes. over that. So uh, uh, Peter goes mm-hmm. through the, tunnel and sees phil bathing naked and phil sees him and chases him away yep bare and then we get bare ass naked (laughs) um we get to part five Mm -hmm. and this might i think this is the final part if there's a part six i didn't note it but um this is the part i have the most notes on because this is when a lot of stuff happens yeah so we get more half naked cowboys romping around they're at some sort of camp i don't know what they're doing honestly so George arrives in a carriage and Rose has this gorgeous maroon top on. They're obviously not made to get dirty. <laughs> they're yeah, not. Yes. They're not working. And Peter has his cute little clothes on, but also his very stiff denim jeans because yes. p- power washing uh, had not been invented by the Gap yet in 1925. Yep. <laughs> Sandblasting those jeans. Yep. So the cowboys make fun. They do. They wolf whistle him mm-hmm. and Matt Damon must be out there. Cause someone calls him the F slur. Um, <laughs> the, the, the one and only time we hear that in this movie. Yep. Um, and this was 2021. Matt Damon was still saying it in 2021. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, he, he slept must on have, set that day. He, he slept on set just to get that in. <laughs> um, and so Phil is like fingering this rope in a very suggestive way. Yeah. And he calls over Peter and in retrospect, there's a lot going on in this scene. But the yeah. first time I watched it, it's like, oh, fuck. And Rose thinks the same thing. He is befriending yeah. her son to get to her. This is the yes. next step of his plan. And that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Yes. It's just like, oh, shit. And she is clearly tormented by this development. Mm-hmm. And it they start hanging out. He puts Peter on Bronco Henry's saddle Mm -hmm. and he shows him that mountain that they were talking about earlier. And Peter is instantly like, there's a dog. (laughs) There's a a howling dog there. Just there's a dog. Yeah. And Phil's like, you saw that. And (laughs) they, they almost find this. I don't, I assume that. Phil's plan was to torment Rose by befriending Peter, mm. but he starts to like him in the yeah, process. I could see that. Yeah. That's my reading of it. Cause he starts to see ways in which they're similar. Yeah. Yeah. I agree actually. And Rose is like, she's getting more and more drunk and upset and mm. yada, yada, yada. So they, um, there's a scene where Peter rides out into the mountains and he finds a dead cow mm-hmm. and he puts on his rubber gloves and starts to do, starts to cut up the cow. Right. And we know Phil doesn't wear gloves. And there was a part of me that was like, is this an AIDS metaphor? Is there like a, <laughs> <laughs> is there like a put on your rubber before you engage with yeah. this? Yeah. If you don't, you will get an infection and die. That's like, funny. I didn't even think of that, but. I, <laughs> yeah. I, I, and I still don't know if that's a, I mean, obviously there's a practical reason for it, right. the gloves, but I was just like, wait a second. Is that what they're doing? Yes. I don't know if that's what they're doing or not. Yeah. Um, huh. So 
Who knows? I did some like very brief Googling power of the dog AIDS metaphor. Nothing comes up. <laughs> so <laughs> When did the, the book came out in the seventies? The seventies. So that was pre AIDS crisis. So the book wouldn't yeah. have engaged with that in any right. way. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But who knows? Maybe Jane Campion was like, Ooh, I, I can't do a New Zealand accent. <laughs> I don't know what she sounded like. <laughs> um, once again, though, George is completely oblivious. Mm-hmm. Rose is trying to say, uh, Phil is taking Peter away. Yeah. And George is like, he's just helping him. Yeah. Dude, wake God. up. Seriously. Just, like, uh, he knows how much of a dick his brother is. He, You're right. He knows that. He's grown yeah. up with this guy, calling him Batso all the time, and just right. being an abusive dickhead. Yep. So we have, he's taking Peter out camping with him, and he's very suggestively like, pounding this pole into the ground and yep. <laughs> <laughs> he's calling him Pete, my pal. Yeah. So they're starting to get a little closer. He gets surprised to see Peter kill this rabbit. Mm-hmm. Peter just snaps its neck and snaps Phil, it. I think, I think it turns Phil on a bit, honestly. <laughs> like, yeah. he's, he's like, like oh, oh. oh, he's not the little uh, pansy that he thought yeah. he was. Right. And so Phil cuts his hand open on this pole, Mm -hmm. um, which will come in to play later. And Phil tells Peter that Bronco Henry said that patience and the odds against him make a man. Mm. And Peter says that his dad told him that it was about obstacles and removing them. Mm. So we get a very interesting bit of their two ideologies yeah. there. And that's when Phil tells Peter that his mom is an obstacle because uh, she's a drunk. Yep. <laughs> so he's still trying to turn them against each other, even maybe, you know, not to the extent that he was before. Right. And that's when we learned that uh, Peter found his father after he hung himself and had to mm-hmm. cut him down. Yes. So there's a lot of trauma there. Back at the ranch, uh, the Native Americans have shown up because they want the hides that they yeah. harvest. And just to be a dick, Phil doesn't like to give them to the Indians. Yeah. It's around Indians. And so Rose, despite him, yep. gives them all away. <laughs> Which like, I love. Yeah, she had no interest in doing it until she talked to, I think, some of the, either it was like cowboys or the housekeepers. And they told her, you know, Phil likes to keep them. He does not. And she bolts she goes well, you bet <laughs> like, oh it's almost like she's the road runner meet me there's a kirsten yep. dunce hole shaped hole <laughs> in the wall and she is out there just like giving them the hides yep and very symbolically they give her gloves as a yes. gift as a barter uh gift so she though she passes out after all this exhaustion and mm-hmm. george has to carry her to bed Phil is understandably pissed off. Yep. And then, I don't know, I don't know how much time is passing at this point. We cut to a bit later where, oh, so now that he doesn't have the hide, he can't finish this rope that he says he's going to give to Peter. Yeah. So Peter says, I have some rawhide that you can use to finish the rope. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, Phil asks him to stay and watch as he finishes this rope. Yep. At one point, the camera shows us a plaque that says in loving memory of Bronco Henry. Mm -hmm. And it just says friend below that. And Peter starts to ask Phil about his relationship with Bronco Henry. Yeah. And Phil tells him how he once saved his life by snuggling naked with him in a bedroll. Yep. And there's lots of erotic smoking between the two of them sharing the cigarette that Peter's, I think Peter starts it, right? He lights the cigarette. I think he does. Gives it to Phil. There's this very sexualized smoking dynamic. Yeah, just like um, two bros would. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> sharing a bedroll, sharing a smoke. Yeah. Um, and then, honestly, pretty quickly, Phil gets sick and dies. <laughs> yeah. And that is when I had to, like, pause the movie, open up Wikipedia, be like, what the hell just happened? It happened so fast. Yeah. Like, he, we see him get sick. His hand is really infected. Yep. And then he's dead. Yeah. And then, like, they really interestingly, they shave him and they bathe him before yeah. they bury him, which is just like a final 
kick in the nards to him. Right. The two things he would have hated. Yes. They do to him. They put him in, frankly, a really little coffin. It looked very small. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and also, I, I don't know if it was meant to be, the, but when um George is the brother, right? When he's picking out the coffin, it seems like he just wants to get it over with. He's like, I'll yeah. just take that one. He just points to the closest one. So it's that's true. What happened. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, no one seems that upset about no. it. We don't get any scenes of mourning no. uh, over Phil. And there's a very brief moment where the doctor talks about Phil's off final days and how awful and excruciating they were mm -hmm. and how he probably died of anthrax. And that's when you get the like, oh, uh, Peter killed him. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> so he had, when he rode out and caught the, he got the anthrax infected cows hide. Mm -hmm. And then since Phil's hand was cut open and he knew he didn't wear gloves, he gave him that rope and passed the infection onto him. Yeah. So yeah. we get the last scene of the movie shows Peter reading, uh, he finds this uh, passage in the Bible, Psalm 22, which says, deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. Mm -hmm. He hides the rope under his bed. He looks out the window and sees Rose and George share a little kiss. Mm -hmm. See, yeah. Happily ever after. Happily ever after. Everyone's happy now. Yeah. So anything we missed in the plot summary? I don't think so. I have a question for you, though. Please. Do you think it's possible that Peter killed his father? So that's a very interesting question because yeah. I don't know if it's intentional that they're giving him Norman Bates vibes. Yeah. <laughs> but like... <laughs> But that's a very good point because was he, do we know, was the father abusive? Do we know? Like, I don't I know don't if remember. they ever say he was abusive, but he was definitely a drunk. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, she had a hard time with him. Yeah. And the fact that he's the one who found his father mm. hanging. Very suspicious. I don't know how, how young he was though when that happened. I would feel really bad if this was like when he was like eight and I'm just accusing him of murder i mean there was a string of movies you know with like kids killing people that's in true. like the 80s and 90s there's this movie called mikey have you ever seen mikey no <laughs> it's a movie that used to be on tv when i was a kid all the time and it's just about a kid who kills people fantastic he's like 10 so. yeah they are great yeah so maybe that's <laughs> what's going on here <laughs> but yeah they do give him he does and I, he does kind of resemble um norman Eddie. bates uh yeah. Both um, Freddie Highmore and Freddie, yeah. OG, uh, I cannot think of his name, but I can. Anthony? We all, Anthony Perkins. Thank you. Yeah. They're tall. They have the tall, slender, dark, yep. goth look. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> dark hair, pale, tall, skinny. So, yeah, he does have very uh, Norman Bates vibes. Yeah. Doing it, yeah. doing it for mom. Right. Loves his mom. But here it's almost sweet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay well, <laughs> well we'll get into that when we get mm -hmm. into our gothic roundup up next yes. all right we ghosties we're back with our gothic roundup and to decide is it gothic so all gothic films have four elements a girl a guy a haunt and a house. So I think this movie can be interpreted in multiple ways, at least three. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so, so who would you vote for our girl? <sighs> and just so our listeners, just as a reminder, if you've never listened before, girl is not technically a gendered term. We use girl to refer to a character who is sometimes, but not always the protagonist who gets drawn into some sort of situation out of their control. In our last few movies, all our girls have been male. I don't know if this is a cop-out, but I would say the first two parts, it would be Rose. And in the last two parts or three parts, how many are there again? Uh, I think, yeah, there's six, I think. Oh, so okay. Three and three. There's Let's no, say, there's five. You're right. There's five. Yeah. The first half Rose, second half Peter. That's what okay. I'm going to say, but I'm interested okay. to know what you have to say. We'll have like two uh, 
two legs here, you know, as mm-hmm. we go down our little parallel tracks. I'm going to stick with, I'm going to try to do like a, almost like a traditional reading of this movie Ooh, okay. with our categories and say our girl is Rose. Okay. And I'm just going to stick with that. Although I don't disagree with you because yeah. we do have two movies almost. Yeah. Um. So, cause like, so my Rose fits into almost all the standard Gothic archetypes. She's poor. Yep. Um, she meets a man who's very rich, mm-hmm. who she does not know very well. Mm-hmm. She gives up her entire life. Like she is a small business owner yeah. <laughs> in 1925. <laughs> you know, yeah. she, she, she owns her own, she owns this inn. She doesn't work there. Yeah. She gives her entire life to move with him to a giant mansion in the middle of nowhere. Mm-hmm. And it's tormented by his awful fucking brother. Yeah. 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 That's why I, I definitely think that Rose is the stronger contender. I think where it splits for me is then that sort of redemption arc that we see a lot of, you know, the Gothic girl mm-hmm. get. I think that that belongs to not redemption arc, this victory arc, I guess. Mm-hmm. Or revenge to, in this case. Revenge. Yeah. Belongs to Peter, but but he does it for his mother. So I guess you could still say that she is. So I like that. We'll go with that. Well, I agree with you too, though, because he also is drawn, he's drawn into the situation yeah. out of his control because he's brought there by her right. to this house, you know, and he's, he's her proxy uh-huh. in a sense. So I yeah. do agree with that. Um, so what about our guy? Who's our guy? I mean, I guess George? is probably what I would say yeah I I think it's George too I you said something I don't remember what podcast it was on but Mm -hmm. something about how the guy doesn't necessarily have to be the villain but the catalyst and George definitely fits into that and his obliviousness as we know drives me up the fucking wall yeah he is at the epicenter of all of this like yeah he's not he's not necessarily yeah a bad guy he's not a villain but he's also annoying as all hell and (laughs) he's just, but he is, he's the catalyst too, because, you know, he finds Rose, he falls in love, he drags her away, yada, yada, yada. In a, in a movie with like literal ghosts, if this were a movie with literal ghosts, she would say your house is haunted. And he would say, no, it's not. That was gravity. Or, you know, he'd be making excuses for it. While right. she's getting attacked by literal spirits from beyond. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Whether or that. not he's in on it. You know, in a lot right. of the movies we watch, a lot of these gothic movies, the guy is in on it. Yeah. But as you said, he does not have to be. Yeah. He's not a bad guy, but he is frustrating. Yeah. I think that should be a, a tell of the guy sometimes. Is how frustrating should... are they? <laughs> how frustrating are they? That's a very good point. And a lot of times, yeah, yeah they're this is almost worse to me because a lot of times they're frustrating because they're there's a plot and yeah. they're frustrating because they're trying to do something. Right. And they're right. trying to get something out of the woman. Whereas in this case, he's frustrating because she is telling him what is happening and he is ignoring her. Yeah, he's just a brick wall in this. Oh my God. Yeah. So we don't have a literal haunt in Mm -hmm. this one. There are no literal spirits, but we do have kind of like the ghost of Bronco Henry. Yes. Who is hovering over everything. Right. And related to that, I think our haunt is homophobia. (laughs) I was just going to say it's homosexuality. (laughs) The other side, but yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So in that, um, that article I mentioned earlier about the affair with Tommy DePaula, it goes into this very deep, analysis of many of Thomas Savage's works. I guess he mm. writes a lot of gay Western. Oh, okay. Um, and there's a, uh, um, a literary critic who talks about the homosexual panic that sometimes mm. occurs in his book, wherein same-sex desire is muted by homophobia, which expresses a bottlenecked masculinity and the psychic opposition to that. Hmm. And the energy of that desire is marked by its denial. And that denial is manifested through self-loathing, suppression, or death. And this movie kind of has all of that. Yeah. And she says that the power of the dog concerns the stripping away of the power from the 
novel, this is about the novel, the novel's yeah. dominant character, Phil Burbank. Phil embodies the tendency to mask gayness through overt homophobia, coupled mm-hmm. with self-loathing, a toxic mix. Yeah. And they say that the most important character is a minor one we never meet, Bronco Henry, whom Savage based on a real life horseman, well known oh. in his day. Okay. Bronco Henry represents Phil's unavailable male lover and love. Mm. And I, there's a passage in the book that they talk about, but um, they say that homosexuality means ostracism and exclusion. And so that develops this misogyny in Phil to stem his own like homophobia and like right. he, that's his cover. Yes. I think Phil is such an interesting que- uh, character too, because you could argue that he he could, if he wanted to, be ostracized because he has the money, he has a house all by himself. Mm. Like, he could. I mean, that's a lot coming from me, you know. But in the 1920s, I'm sure it would have been very, very difficult and everything. But compared to other characters, you know, he might have semi-been okay. Um, and, but he just... He, I think he craves this like leader of the pack mentality. Like he just mm. always, you know, that's why he has like his gaggle of cowboys behind him and stuff. And, you know, I think more than anything, that's the power he doesn't want to lose is like yeah. having control of a group of people. He likes to be in control, clearly. Definitely. Yeah. But yeah, like you said, he's got tons of money. He's yeah. been able to choose the lifestyle that he wants yeah. to live. Um, and yeah, it is just, I, he gets in over his head when he starts to like care for Peter almost, Yeah, you know, that's what becomes of the rope, another symbol, symbolic thing, um, becomes something to, I feel like initially harm Peter, um, a way to lure him in becomes, I don't know that like the noose he hangs himself with, you know, theoretically in the end, then we get back to the hanging father. Maybe Peter did have something to do with it. There's a lot of ropes and father figures being killed by ropes and yeah we never learn how bronco henry died i was just gonna ask you i was like did they ever mention that i don't think they did yeah no he fell off his horse maybe maybe but he was also i mean people died young back then so like i mean if he's if he was 20 years older than phil right and i I wish i had paid attention because that plaque i think says when he died Oh, um, okay. but by the time you see the plaque, I forget what year the movie took place in. So yeah. I was like, oh, I don't know. I can't I go back and look anymore. that up. Yeah. But yeah, so that's like our, the, the haunt is the, the homophobia, the toxic masculinity, just like yep. society itself yeah. is, is seeping into things. We live Anything in a you society. Wanted... <laughs> we live in a society. <laughs> uh, all right. Jo- Jared Leto. Was that Jared Leto? No, who was that? <laughs> it's a joker, right? Um, yeah. Uh, anything you wanted to add to our haunt? No, I think that about sums it up. Okay. So uh, then we have our house. Mm-hmm. Um, as we said, they're rich. They have this gigantic yes. house. We don't get a lot of the house, though. No, we don't. The only thing I would mention with the house is there's this gorgeous scene. I think it's after Phil learns um, that his brother is married where he's sitting at a dining room table. I could have the placement of that scene mixed up, but there's a part where you see this huge window, you know, and a dining room table and the mountain through the window. It's so stunning. It looks like, like a painting of, it looks like it's the artwork of the house. It's so beautiful. Um, And there's so many like instances of that where it's like a pretty, you know, even though it's a big house, it's a nice house. Like it's pretty average. It's nothing to write home about, but I think it was like very purposeful that there's just like all of these like natural windows, this natural light for the most part. I mean, you have the nighttime scenes where it looks really dark in there, but what are you going to do? Um, yeah, it's the twenties. I don't think exactly. I'm so bad at history. I'm like, did they have electricity? Did they have a light bulb? Yeah. (laughs) I have no clue. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I mean, this is their family home. So they yeah. clearly built, they've been able to construct this home right. how they want it. Yeah. It's stunning. I mean, the yeah. the actual outside area of it. I mean, they have a badminton court. Like, hell yes. <laughs> that's, no, that's true. <laughs> yeah, it's so good. But it'd be pickleball today. Yeah. 
it's a pretty standard house besides that I feel like there aren't any like huge things that really stuck out to me and other than like the piano scene with her at the Mm. piano and Phil kind of on the second floor landing they don't really do anything with the geography of the house well there's that and then there's like the conjoined bathroom but right there's not like in a lot of gothic movies we'll have a chase scene you know through the house or something but this isn't that type of movie right the the house itself was just an exterior that they built Mm. and then all the interiors were shot on a sound stage they show that in the behind the scenes documentary yeah. they show them constructing it and then like breaking it down which is kind wow. of interesting wow. but um we do have um we've got uh, quite a few bonus gothics yes. we have the, the panano and we the can't panano. move beyond that the panano yep we have score by former radiohead band member johnny greenwood <laughs> really how exciting <laughs> johnny greenwood shows up again <laughs> <laughs> so good and like the this goes back to just my initial view where like, it's not quite incest, but there is that like odd relationship, yeah. not reciprocal. Cause George definitely does not feel the same way, but there is that relationship that Phil has towards George. Yeah. It's again, like I, I, I would like to interpret it as being more protective and being, you know, I think when, I'm not a psychology major. I don't know what I'm talking about, but I think sometimes when you're someone who can't, who, who isn't accepting of certain parts of your lives, it's easier to live the same life just constantly and consistently. It's probably why he didn't stay at Yale. He just wanted to come home and do what he knew he was best at. So to have anything mix up that life, you know, it's going to make you reevaluate in different ways. So I, I think there is a romantic rivalry there, but it's almost Mm. like he's rivaling. He's angry with himself in a way. I'm sorry. That sounded very leather coach, uh, very leather couch. (laughs) No, I like it. (laughs) Yeah. But yeah, I would, I would like to think he's not romantically attracted to fatso, but um you know and I don't yeah and I mean now that I've watched it a few times I definitely don't have that anymore because I think early on he's like why don't you and me just go out by ourselves you know into the mountains and you know (laughs) stuff like that where I was like wait and that's when I didn't even realize they were related yeah um and and I think it's confusing because for Phil there's such a fine line for him between the masculine behavior and the homosexuality like With Bronco Henry, he was both his masculine ideal and his lover. So yeah. for Phil, there's this confusion there, I think, between like hanging out with the guys and like <laughs> hanging out with the guys. Hanging out so, with the guys. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but also, <laughs> one thing I didn't mention that when they all, all the men go bathing naked in the yeah. river, yeah. Phil separates himself from yeah. them, which I actually find kind of sad because it's like he, knows he can't do that with them because he is different from them. He has to self ostracize from them. Yeah. Because they don't do it. It's not like they tell him to do that. He chooses to out of, I think, a fear of being with them in that environment. Yeah, that's a good point. So so with all that said, uh, what do you think? Is this movie gothic? I think so. Like, I do. I kind of wanted, actually, I think at the beginning of this, I was going to give it gothish, but I think the more we talked about it, the more I'm rooting for gothic. I agree. Yeah. Um, it On the surface, this is the least gothic seeming movie yes. we've talked about. Absolutely. But at its core, it really almost intentionally knows its gothic yeah. elements. Because it right. adheres to them so well. And there's, we haven't yet talked, we've, we've thought about talking about Phantom Thread um, mm-hmm. at some point. And Phantom Thread's very similar, but it does actually throw in a ghost no. <laughs> in that one. <laughs> um, and like, if this one had, if you had seen an apparition of Ooh, Bronco Henry, Bronco Henry. You know, it almost wouldn't have seemed out of place depending on yeah. how they filmed it um so you know he's there we just don't as viewers see him so but he's definitely there it's real as any other ghost 
Yeah, that's very fun. And I think it's fun too, because, you know, sometimes we have to, you know, intentionally say um, that something's an American Gothic because it doesn't Mm -hmm. really adhere to our rules. But this one is sort of, you know, it doesn't even really have to do with the American Gothic either, because there isn't any fear of the unknown. Like nature is very much a part of the movie, but it's 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 wrangled, you know, it's lassoed. Mm-hmm. They got it. That's true. They're in control of nature. Yeah. Going back to what you said about Phil wanting to control things. He's yeah. in control of all that. Exactly. So it's it's really fun that we don't even have to say it's an American gothic. Like this mm-hmm. feels very authentically gothic. It feels like Crimson Peak to me at times. Yeah. Because she's getting pulled into this house and like, uh, right. you know, if we think about Rose, you know, and, you know, it's just, uh, yeah. yeah. And it's stressful. It's a stressful it's movie. So stressful. It's so stressful. I mean, this is not, you know, no one, no one's gonna like if Blockbuster was still around, we would not put this in the horror section of Blockbuster. But right. that scene of her playing the piano gives me such that whole dinner scene gives me such deep-seated dread that it just exactly. makes me want to vomit. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a hard one to watch. It's a tough one. Yeah. yeah. So anything else you want to add? I don't think so. I'm really glad that you had me watch this movie because I don't think I would have gotten around to it, honestly. And I really, it's actually, quick side note, um, one of my favorite books of all time is East of Eden by John Steinbeck. Okay. And that's one of those books that I never in a million years thought I would pick up. And then I saw a YouTuber talking about it and how interesting the characters were and how like deliciously villainous this one character were, was. And so I picked it up and I love it. And I think I got like very much that vibe from this movie where it's like on the surface, I thought it was going to be, you know, it, it is a slow movie. It's, you know, it's a slow like burn. it's not supposed to be an action movie. Like don't go into it thinking it's going to be some delicious murder mystery thing, but it's so engrossing. It's such a fun mm-hmm. movie. Yeah. The most action packed thing is Kirsten Dunst trying to play piano. <laughs> It put me in a cold sweat. (laughs) It did. It did. Uh, Well, I think that does it then. Yeah. So yeah, thank you, we ghosties, for listening to us break down power of the dog. Please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and share us with a friend if you have a movie lover in your life. If they don't like horror movies, you can share this one. You know, we yes. can we can all talk about gothic. It doesn't always have to be graphic violence and blood and gore. No, so. just bull <laughs> testicles. <laughs> oh, yeah, that is pretty graphic. <laughs> that is it's pretty graphic. graphic. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, like, did they actually cast? Like, I want to know if they actually did it. That was a on camera. Scene. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, yeah. you know, those are some really... Uh, I mean, I've never seen it happen, but they seem pretty realistic to be prosthetic yeah. bull testicles. Yeah. So maybe Benedict Cumberbatch just loves castrating bulls in his spare maybe he time. Does. I don't know. Yeah. You know, rich, pe- rich, pe- rich people have weird habits. <laughs> it's weird, weird hobbies. So um, anyway, <laughs> um, so drop us an email at sogothicpod at gmail.com. You can send us comments, suggestions for future films. Just say hi. And you can follow us on Instagram at sogothicpod. And join us next time. We'll post some clues as to what we're talking about on our Instagram. Boo-bye. Bye-bye.